My dear Mr. Bennett, over here. Oh, yes. Uh, there you are, Darcy. Very well, very well. <laughs> I've got my favorite table near the fire. Uh, Percy, two whiskeys, quickly, please. Sit, sit, Father, and warm yourself. Oh, the Athenaeum Club, it is indeed a most extraordinary and wonderful place. <laughs> yes, I was honored to, uh, thank you, to be asked to join shortly after it opened. It impressed me as a place where men of science and letters shared interesting ideas much more captivating than political arguments or financial debates that I usually endure when I assemble with colleagues and friends. I became a member on the basis of that Jack Russell Terrier breeding program that Elizabeth and I started 10 or 12 years ago. The original dogs came from the good Reverend John Russell himself, and the clever Mr. Darwin has commented on more than one occasion that he sees a place for our work in a book he's working on. Oh, I love that pup that you gave me, but I don't expect my Tilly will be well and truly trained until perhaps Lizzie becomes a member of this club. <laughs> I'm sorry it's as bad as that. I've heard more than one founder say women will be members of the Athenaeum Club at the second coming of our Lord, or in the next millennium, whichever comes last. No, indeed, indeed. Well then, how is my favorite daughter, at any rate, given my advanced years, and the fact that dear Mrs. Bennet has passed on to a better place, where her prayers and other demands might be met, I'm now free to say that without fear of rebuke. She's in very good spirits, sir. We went for an early winter walk at Pemberley the other day, and reflected on the fact that we have now been married as long as you and our dear late Mrs. Bennet were when Elizabeth and I first met. 23 years has gone by in the blink of an eye. Of course, children and the proper management at Pemberley, including now the Jack Russells, have certainly helped us mark the time. And we recently got the news that our second daughter, Lydia, is with child. So soon we will be grandparents again. And you, sir, will be Even once again. older and more decrepit than I am now, but still no wiser. Children mark the time indeed, my boy. And grandchildren are a delight, particularly when they vex their parents. But great-grandchildren simply tell one that the end is perilously near. Remind me how many children you have. I lose track of even my own children some days. We have five children, and you have 14 grandchildren from your wonderful daughters. An impressive legacy, sir. Not without cost, my son, both fiduciary and emotional. To have lived a life where more than half was with six women. A blessing, sir. Indeed. Although looking back on some days, it feels like much of the blessing is in the looking back in one's dotage rather than a living through in one's prime. Well, if I may say, I have learned much from your example, Mr. Bennett. I am judicious with praise, miserly with criticism, but lavish in bestowing guidance and support. And I note that you are too kind to specify how often you have been guided by me in what or what not to do or say. Well, uh, be that as it may, Part of the reason I asked you here this evening was that I wanted to seek your counsel on a matter concerning our children and your grandchildren. Elizabeth and I are currently of two minds on the subject. Well then, if you truly know a little of me after our more than two decades of acquaintance, you will know that I have heard all I need to hear. Whatever Lizzie thinks should be done, should be done. This is a little more complicated than that, I fear, and requires some explanation before judgment. Uh, two more whiskeys, please. As you know, our three oldest children, Robert, Charles, and Martha, were born on the same day just over 21 years ago, the 8th of September in 1812. Ah, yes. The same year Napoleon was repelled by the Russians. Uh, yes, indeed. Well, our... 1812 Overture has somewhat complicated my estate planning, 
given the laws of primogeniture, with which I know you have some familiarity? It's a man who has had five daughters, no sons, and a socially conscious wife, not to mention an enthusiastic cousin to which my estate is entailed. Yes, I am quite familiar. Well, in a curious way, I have the opposite problem. We have two eldest sons, not to mention an eldest daughter. And I begin to see that you have been blessed and cursed in an entirely different way than I was. I consider it all a blessing and a fine problem to have. But the problem remains. Is there no record of the order of the emergence on the day of the children's birth? Surely a legal decision was made at the time of birth as to which child was oldest. Unfortunately, and uniquely as far as I know, no determination was rendered that day. The attending doctor, um, Stoffman was his name, had been at a dinner party that evening. It was just after cigars and sherry that we sent word to Stoffman that he was needed. Being triplets, it was, of course, a highly unusual and risky birth, which by God's grace resulted in three wailing babies and a tired but otherwise healthy mother. But things happened so fast and so chaotically that no one, least of which the good doctor, knew who arrived first, or second, or even third, for that matter. So how do you... And how does Lizzie propose to solve this riddle? I have been careful in the management of my estates and holdings, so there is enough to leave the family estate to one child and the equivalent value in other capital to each of the other children. I propose to Elizabeth that Robert and Charles draw lots in the presence of my solicitor to see which inherits the estate and which inherits the equivalent value. Uh, Martha would, of course, inherit the equivalent value. And Lizzie's view? I think I can guess it. Lizzie proposes that all three children draw lots. If Martha draws the estate lot and is thus chosen to inherit the estate, I would challenge the law of primogeniture up to the, and including the House of Lords, if necessary. Among other things, I would certainly lose my standing in society, including membership here at the Athenaeum Club. And as I feared and expected, and I see, I see. Lizzie's view is sympathetic, admirable, and understandable, but of course, completely untenable. The natural God-given greater authority and entitlement of men over women in a family is the foundation of not just English common law, but civilization around the world, even in America. How can she think asserting Martha's entitlement would end well? So, you see my view then. Indeed. An unhappy alternative is before you, Mr. Darcy. If Martha draws the estate lot, you will not see the inside of this club again if you challenge primogenitor and leave the Darcy estate to Martha. And I will never see you again if you don't. You said her view was untenable. You said it would end badly if Martha drew the estate lot. Yes, yes, indeed I did. So what are you suggesting we do? Have all three children draw lots, but be absolutely certain that Martha does not draw the estate lot. Are you advocating dishonesty to Mrs. Darcy? You mentioned that you've learned much from me. Perhaps you noted over the years that I was on rare occasions somewhat dishonest towards Mrs. Bennet in a way that led ultimately to a satisfactory conclusion. But Elizabeth's challenge will never be... Her challenge is ably carried by your joint decision to bestow equal capital on all three children, while I'm sure amply providing for the rest of your heirs. I begin to see wisdom in your practical suggestion. Another whiskey here, please. This is more wisdom 
and more whiskey for me than for many an evening. The Bennets and the Darcys unite once again. Long live the Bennet dynasty. And long live the Darcy dynasty and your continuing challenge of both pride and prejudice.